Good evening and welcome to the world today. My guest is uh, Professor Ajaz Ahmed. Um, I'm very pleased to have this guest in particular because I've been studying and uh, reading him for a long, long time. Ajaz, welcome. Thank you, Ajaz. Um, what about the situation in the country where you're living at the moment, Trump? Um, how long will this guy last? Can he get a second term? Or will traditional liberal order be restored? Uh, <clears throat> about the second term, I think um, I'd like to say very quickly that uh, a, uh, first, it's a little too early to say, but also that the Democratic Party is now in such doldrums mm. uh, <clears throat> that even if some was, something was presented to them on a platter, they wouldn't be able to take it. Uh, because the way they sabotaged Sanders' campaign uh, <clears throat> shows that they would rather have right-wing Republicans than uh, progressive, progressive uh, New Deal Democrat. I mean, that's what essentially Sanders yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so they would prefer um, right-wing Republican rule to uh, something like that. Even though Sanders never, never even touch the question of U.S. imperialism and warfare no. abroad. No. You know, fought his entire election on domestic policies. Yeah. Uh, even then. <clears throat> so um, so that, that's my sense, that, 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 that there's a crisis in the Democratic Party. Now, um, uh, a couple of things uh, about uh, Trump's um, victory. First, white American working class voted for Obama overwhelmingly twice. A black president, no racism, majority. They were betrayed so badly that those six million white working class votes, they either went to Trump or they didn't oh. vote. Hmm. Now, uh, people are talking about race, this, that, and the other. Uh, the white working class did not prove racist when... When they voted Obama. When, 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 twice. Uh, when voted Obama, chalk a block. Uh, <clears throat> it was really out of spite that they voted either for Trump or for... Uh, had Sanders run the elections, he would have got those six million votes. Uh, <clears throat> so vote was... Trump, Trump was very much brought in there. The only hope I had from Trump, very marginal, very small, was that since he came from outside the historic Republican Party establishment in defiance of that establishment, he could perhaps in the first two or three months take certain steps precisely on the question of wars in the Middle East before he got sucked into the, uh, the, the uh, you know, and, and, and restraint. Um, it appears that he never was really serious about that. He was trying to win over that vote. Which the anti-war vote. Uh, yes, right. So um, <clears throat> beyond that, I think it was always a demagogic um, right-wing rhetoric. I don't think he, he was ever serious, serious about his economic policies. I do think that there was something in his and his group's mind, especially the ones who were always called fascists, the ultra-right that was supporting him, they thought that all this expenditure on the wars is a waste of U.S. resources. They should be spent on rebuilding American economy. And the infrastructure. And the infrastructure. So they were in a very peculiar way sort of nationalists. The word, uh, all this business of isolationism and this, that, I think <coughs> the terminology is wrong, is incorrect. They actually wanted to build an American economy instead of... Adventurism. Adventurism. And that rebuilding would, would give us jobs. And they understood that jobs that are gone are gone. They're not coming back. But you can create new jobs by building new infrastructures by building, you know, various sorts of other things. And the generals came in. Those generals, Matisse, and Flynn, who was just proved to be too much, 
These are the people who represented what in America is called the deep state. But I do believe um, that there is another state which is invisible in America, which has been in, in place since the time of Lyndon Johnson or whatever. No, and so this is a problem even if he wanted to surmount, he couldn't. Right. Right. You know, it's, it's embedded in the structures of that's the right. imperial that's state. That's right. Who, it doesn't matter who's president. Yeah. You, you see, you see this, is, this is part of my whole argument about a post-democratic state. Yeah. That the ritual, the visible ritual, and the actual policy making and implementation and so on, there's such a great gap in what is visible and what is not visible. Is the, the gap is getting wider and wider. What do you think in terms of, I mean, I know the electoral system militates against it in the States and in the United Kingdom, but the idea which has been around for ages of a third more progressive party of the American liberal left and the left in general, do you think this is feasible? In, in the United States, it's, it, has, it is not only not feasible, it has been proven time and again. When the Rainbow Coalition of Jesse Jackson yeah. came on, uh, several attempts of various sorts that, ha that have been... Uh, and now there is now a movement, I think a disastrous movement, to, to talk about creating a people's party that would be headed by son Sanders and so on. Sanders is not keen on that at all. Well, but, he wants to be a democratic of, president. That's right, that's yeah. right. And he... he, he uh, <clears throat> That is one side. The other side of the argument, actually, the Tariq is one that uh, just of necessity, I believe, has weight. That if you don't transform the Democratic Party, you don't, no. you, you're not dealing with power. No. You know, you're dealing with protest. Uh, so you should really just, <clears throat> he won. Um, he was prevented by by the by the by the big, by the big trust, the establishment. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, he was winning. Uh, and had he been the candidate, I am convinced he would have won. Uh, the, he would have cut into the Trump vote, and he would have got many votes from people who who didn't who vote. Didn't, didn't vote. Uh, <clears throat> so his thing his thing is that look, there is a grassroots transformation going on in this country uh, which came to a certain kind of quasi-organization uh, form uh, during his candidacy. And uh, this is what needs to be stabilized. And this is what needs to be fought, fought over. This should not be handed over. If you have a third party, you hand it back to the Congress, to, to, the, uh, to them. So they're certainly not... in. Britain, uh, I know much less. I, you know, I, I observe Britain from a distance. <clears throat> no, in Britain too, it's fortuitous, really, that we had Corbyn, uh, that the right of the party, hoping to completely marginalise trade unions, decided to allow anyone who supported the party to join, not right. dreaming that these people would vote for the <laughs> right. left. That's right. Yeah, That's right. they've now realized that. But meanwhile, Labour has got over half a million members. Right. right. Uh, so it's, you know, not always the case that ordinary people are completely in the grip of a hostile media. Mostly the young people ignore it now. Right. They don't okay. take it right. seriously. Right. Yes. But so we'll see how it pans out here. But here they got a shock when the Tories who were hoping to get a hundred seat majority suddenly found oh, themselves. Okay. It's a huge the minority shock. minority government. Yeah. Dependent on those right wing crazies for... Yeah. No, for so running the country at all. Yeah. Right. So we shall see how it works. But Ajaz, let's move on now to uh, another part of the world which we've touched on, <clears throat> which is very unique uh, in its own way, uh, and where politics are quite unique, where a <coughs> strange process has been taking place. That's India, where... Uh, ultra-right, but really ultra-right in every sense of the word, philosophically as well as in its practice, theory and practice, the RSS, 
which, you know, one could call a semi-fascist uh, organization, the way it functions, the way it exists, the way it infiltrates, probably more effective in some ways than the traditional fascist groups of interwar Europe, is now in power. It has a prime minister. Not a day goes by that we don't hear from somewhere or the other in India. Six Muslims killed here, ten here, two here, three there, which adds up. And of course, while Muslims are the principal target of this sort of political purification and permanent ethnic cleansing campaign, Christians are also being dealt with in, in, in the same way. So could you explain to our viewers how this political formation rose from where it was 50 years ago to where it is now. I mean, on virtually any level, it's quite a sensational achievement. And it's not an achievement that just happened. It's been planned and it's been going on. Right. Um, I think the left has always underestimated it. RSS in India and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt were founded in the 1920s both inspired by European uh, right of the Nazis and the Italian fascists and so on, very, very uh, consciously, just like the, the Ba'ath in Iraq and Syria. Or th there were a number of such parties. The two that have endured and grown are the RSS and the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, Muslim Brotherhood has become much more of a pan-Arab uh, formation, but still the, the real heart of it is in Egypt uh, <clears throat> and the RSS in India. So one is a historical depth and a almost Olympian uh, sort of patience. Um, the great, one of the great differences that the RSS and the historical uh, right wing, you know, into, uh, European right wing of the interwar years is that, um, and this is what I have put it, that, uh, you know, almost a Gramscian sense that you have to actually first transform society before you... Go for power. Go for power. <coughs> uh, your power would be much more deeply embedded if you have actually culturally and religiously and so on, philosophically turned, would be, you know, so transformation of the society has always been very important for them. The second thing that is uh, completely unique about them is that they are, the RSS itself is essentially a cadre party, what we know as cadre party. Becoming a member of the RSS is very difficult uh, thing. You can be a member of their Front. Any of their front organizations. Of which they have many. Of, uh, 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 I mean, certainly in the hundreds, if not thousands, uh, fronts. Yeah. Uh, when in the 1930s, some women went up there and said, you have only all males, this, that, and the other. We need membership in that. They said, you organize your own. And they organized a very big women's organization. No woman can be a member of the RSS. No woman can be a member of the RSS. No, you have to be a member of their women's wing. Uh, so literally, they are kept. It away. is an all <clears throat> largely upper caste, um, uh, etc. So it's, a, it's an absolutely a cadre party. When the time of the elections comes, RSS does not fight elections, but literally hundreds of thousands of trained cadre come into the electoral field wherever the and gets the BJP candidates elected. Uh, there's no equivalent for it in the Congress. So, Charles, are you suggesting that the B Bharatiya Janata Party, the ruling party in India, the BJP, is essentially a political front of absolutely, the RSS? Absolutely, that is what I have put. Uh, and it, there is this confusion, even the way Indian uh, knowledgeable people in India right, knowledgeable people on the left right, who should know much better, um, that they make the... the, the, the they start talking of the BJP as a fascist organization. It is not. It's a political front precisely to 
address the question of parliamentary democracy and function perfectly as a parliamentary democracy. Without challenging any other parties? No. No, we are all, you know, we are all fighting elections, etc., etc. Uh, <clears throat> it is the RSS, which is not a part of any of this. It, it is not, it, it is registered as a cultural organization, so it is not required to reveal either its membership or, or its finances. Mm -hmm. All right. So we really don't know uh, ultimate numbers. They claim there are other ways of calculating, but exact numbers we don't know. They're not obliged to tell us. Uh, <clears throat> they call themselves cultural organizations, but then they turn around and say that in Hindu society, everything is culture. Politics is culture, economy is culture, religion is culture, everything is, is culture. We are a cultural organization. We are a, of, of the Hindu people, and therefore we tell, we guide political organizations. We are, uh, they, There's they, not nothing else cetera, like it. Etc. Yeah. It ha there has never been anything like it anywhere in the world. 1925, this is 2017, the only time when for some years they did not grow, so far as we know, were the years immediately after Gandhi's assassination for which they were blamed. Well, they, they, uh, I mean, rightly so, correctly right. so, they were responsible. In 1948. In 1948, Gandhi was assassinated by somebody who was not only a member, but it has now been known that he had, uh, you know, th th that it was a conspiracy to, to kill Gandhi. Uh, but the, hang on, Ajaz, a conspiracy which involved who? Well, certainly local members, a whole number of local members of the RSS and the Hindu Mahasabha. Ah, you're right. Now there are plays staged in Maharashtra, in Marathi language. In which they celebrate it. They celebrate it. So, um, anyway, what we know is that for some years during that time, their membership declined. After killing Gandhi. After killing Gandhi, just for a few years. Um, they were uh, banned for about two or three years, and then Sardar Patel, who was the Home Minister, well, he was, uh, prevailed yes. over Gandhi, to, over them mm -hmm. to uh, legalize them again and so on. Uh, <clears throat> other than those few years, they have only grown. So even the RSS now is, um, is uh, I mean, we don't know, but uh, membership runs certainly into the tens of thousands, if not. Of, of the of, RSS. Of the RSS itself. The mother group. The right? mother group, yeah. right. Uh, they have some 60,000 schools where they... Uh, Hindu madrasas. Hindu madrasas, where they nominally teach the normal uh, syllabus, but for the rest it's pure indoctrination, and uh, th that's where their cadre uh, come from. Some of them are drawn into the RSS, most of them are funneled into the fronts. There's a kind of Hindutva has become the common sense of an immense number of Indians. Uh, and I think it's a whole historical period that we have it's to go through. It's a big shift. It is not a question of next elections or the elections after. RSS has never been very, you know, very much focused on the next elections of the after. They always are looking for that because if you have government, you get funds, you get this, you get that. And you dominate the <laughs> institutions. Yes, institutions, you, you make appointments you know, so it is. Um, it is a takeover through long march, long march, march through the institutions <laughs> from but, the right. <laughs> but Ajaz, uh, okay. Uh, granted, all this is the case, um, and granted that the BJP, if they say if they lose the next election, there's not going to be. They'll accept the defeat. And Absolutely. say, okay, you have a yeah. vote. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They are, they've done they are, that before. They play by by the book of the liberal uh, Establish. establishment. Yeah. Okay, but what would you say is the ultimate aim of the RSS? What what India do they want? Let's say they keep winning for the next fifty years. 
What do we have at the end of it? We have an India in which certainly the minorities will be second class citizens if that. There would be terror enough for much of the middle class to middle class Muslims and Christians to just slowly emigrate out of the country. Or convert. Or convert, but I don't think anybody but the very poor will convert. Uh, the ones who have uh, enough education or enough um, means of some sort, they would just migrate to from anywhere from the, uh, from the Gulf states to the We're Western right. countries or whatever. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the poorest and the most helpless elements would be left. The great objective of the RSS is in fact to assimilate the lower castes into a single monolithic <clears throat> uh, Hindu world. To break the caste divide? Absolutely. And uh, they want to be, for the first time, they're the first manifestation in, in several hundred years of a Hindu uh, organization which want to be church and state at the same time. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> they have um, they, they have a strategy which incorporates middle castes, lower castes, or what, what they call Varmasis, uh, but in, in English we call tribals. All sections of society, um, bringing them into the Hindu fold, except Muslim and Christian minorities, uh, who will be second class citizens, but beyond that, that they have imperial visions. They have what? Imperial visions. Ah. Expansionist. The world from the Far East to Afghanistan and beyond is their immediate vision. Hmm. To rise as a great yes. power. Um, they have, they have imperial ambitions. There has been a notion that India has, should be a great power in the way that Great Britain or France once were great colonial powers, or, mm -hmm. or the United States is without having colonies or exactly. something. So it is that kind of ambition. It's not just dominating Pakistan or Bangladesh or Sri it's Lanka and so on. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> that they could achieve very easily, yeah. and that is a is, is an ambition that the, that all ruling elites in India have. Um, in Nepal, when the Maoists uh, were taking over, uh, they thought they, they they had the right, and they continue to intervene in Nepal and so on. Uh, or Sri Lanka, they sent the troops into Sri Lanka. But there is a kind of an imperial vision. You, you said 50 years from now. Mm. So what they envision for themselves, mm. that is their time frame. That, that first we'll secure this the, inside the country, and, and then, then we will rise as a great power in the world. But, Ejaz, I mean, even the most uh, demented elements amongst this group must realize that China is economically, socially, militarily, technologically, technologically, culturally, culturally the most dominant Absolutely. power Absolutely. in Asia, Absolutely. which the Indians are leap years behind. Absolutely. There's no way they can Absolutely. overtake them. And that, you know, let's be honest, despite what's happened in China and how it's been implemented, the great revival of China is the result of the 1949 Absolutely. October yes. Revolution. It is the, the counter revolution has reaped the benefits of, of the, the revolution. They it say it. You know. They've educated a complete healthy, holy. educated, disciplined population, devoted to productivity, etc. etc. was produced by the revolution. So the Indian aim to supplant China is just... Yeah, but, but, you but know, that, that is their vision. That's their but, vision. But you, you see, they, Erdogan, as soon as the so-called Arab Spring started, 
Erdogan thought he was going to be the emperor of this region. He started going off to Cairo and uh, Tunisia and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, you know, it didn't quite work out. It didn't quite work out, but these visions are there in these RSS, um, Muslim Brotherhood sort of world. These visions are, are, are there. One of the things we've been discussing is uh, the volatility of the subjected citizenry, let's put it like that, not just the working class, but many other uh, social layers in society. Where could this volatility lead? I mean, I, it's awful to sound so pessimistic, but till now, all the experiments since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Bolivarian republics, Venezuela is tragically in deep trouble politically and uh, economically. Uh, it's ironic to think that the most interesting development has been in Britain, where Corbyn is the first leader of the Labour Party who has publicly said he's not in favour of NATO or nuclear weapons, and who has publicly said that the reason for the terrorist attacks on country are a right. result yeah. of UK foreign that policy, is, yeah. which no Absolutely. other politician has no. said. No, and no. and and two thirds of the population supported him the supported. next day. So the Conservatives dropped this as a right. campaigning right. thing. Right. There doesn't appear to be anything today that has a plan, even state by state, to challenge this global capitalism. That's our problem. The Communist parties in Europe collapsed years ago. It's happening in India now, whether we like it or not. The left is very weak. Mm. And what used to be the liberal center has collapsed. Has collapsed. So the two great traditions descended from the Enlightenment. Oh, <laughs> in, in a bad way. Uh, in a bad way. So it is um, natural that these people would have the initiative all over the world. Um, certainly so. And my fear is, Tariq, that um, next economic downturn of a major, uh, of the 2008 type. And countries like the United States can just go over the edge. And the far right can really take care of that, take hold of that state. You see, unlike Corbyn in Britain, where it is based in a major political party and it's a takeover of that party. Uh, and the resistance to it is from the Blairites who are now on the defensive and so on, that is not what has happened in the United States. In the United States. Uh, what, is, what has happened is that all these people who had actually been mobilized first by the Obama campaigns and who were disappointed but who, were, who had that experience, instead of becoming cynical and going home, they created another sort of momentum and pushed Sanders yeah. forward, up and up and up, and we just sat there watching Watch this it. happen. This Corbyn again, it is precisely those people who joined the Labour Party and who pushed then yeah, people yeah, in course. momentum and so on. It's, it's the mass movement that has created that. Now, what happens in other countries? But my sense is that unless something major happens in, in Europe, and that becomes something a, a pole of attraction. A, a pole of attraction and for people to learn that, that this can be done, this can be done. Um, something of that sort has to happen. Uh, as of now, you, you see the Bolivarian experiment was spectacular, great, wonderful. But once Venezuela got into that kind of trouble, no matter what happens in, in Bolivia, it cannot be an international example. No, it was you know, it's too small, too weak a, a country. Or Ecuador. Uh, or Ecuador. They're too small to... They can have impact on the immediate region, but not beyond that. The interesting thing is that that kind of possibility of transformation has come back to the old countries like Britain and, and France. Ijaz, on that note, we will come to an end to be continued some other time. Thank you very much, Tariq. Thank you, Ijaz. Wonderful.